Hi there, welcome to the Electronics Lab. In this video, we are going to learn about the insidious, non-ideal feature of op amps called the input bias current. In an ideal op amp, the input impedance of the inverting and the non-inverting pin approach infinity, and therefore, no current flows into either of the input terminals. In reality, a small current will flow into the terminal to bias the transistors inside the op amp. And this value can range from as low as 60 femtoamps up to as high as hundreds of nanoamps. This schematic shows the inside of a 741 op amp. And you can see here the non-inverting and the inverting pins. You can see that the connections of the non-inverting and inverting pins go straight into the bases of transistors Q1 and Q2. Remember that to bias BJTs, the current into the base is small, but not zero. So if the op amp is powered, there will be some current that flows into the non-inverting and inverting inputs. If the op amp uses FETs, the input biasing current will be even lower, but still not zero. And in fact, most of the input bias current for op amps designed with FETs is actually not due to current into the gate, but actually due to current leakage through the input protection diodes at the input. In normal operation, all four of these diodes are reverse biased, but they will all have some leakage current through them contributing to the input bias current. The definition of the input bias current is that it is the average of the two currents going into the inverting and non-inverting pins of the op amp. And a related measurement called the input offset current is equal to the difference between the two currents. This input offset current is really only a meaningful value when Q1 and Q2 and their associated input bias currents are well matched and close in value, in which case the input bias current will be much bigger than the input offset current. So what effect does the input bias current have on a circuit? Well, let's take a look at this circuit, which is an inverting amplifier configuration, but with the input grounded to better see the effect of input bias current. There is current into the non-inverting terminal, but it has no real effect on the output voltage since it doesn't pass through any external resistors to create any kind of voltage drop. However, the current into the inverting terminal must come from the output here because there is no voltage difference between ground and the inverting terminal. So there's not going to be any current flowing through RI, at least in this input grounded configuration. Therefore, all of that I bias current has to flow through RF, which will cause a voltage drop across RF which means V out will not be at zero volts as expected. It will be at that I bias current times RF. So input bias current causes problems when it flows through external impedances, creating voltage drops. So it looks like both input bias current and input offset voltage introduced DC errors into op amp circuits due to mismatches in the input stage of an op amp. The errors introduced by the input offset voltage occur inside the op amp, while the errors introduced by the input bias current occur due to current through components on the outside of the op amp. Input bias current prevents you from capacitively coupling the input of an op amp. If you put a capacitor here, you are blocking the input bias current which will prevent the transistors inside the op amp from working properly. Input bias current and input offset current are both values that you will find on a data sheet, as you can see here from these snapshots of data sheets of op amps from Texas Instruments and analog devices. These data sheets give you ranges of values, including a maximum, and you can see that they also change with temperature. If you want to know the input bias current of a particular op amp that you have, like let's say we want to know what it is for this particular op amp right here, you can build a fairly simple measuring circuit like this one. Here's the device under test, and these switches can be opened and closed to measure the different bias currents into the two different terminals of the device under test. This part of the circuit here is the negative feedback into the testing op amp, and the output of this testing op amp will be used to determine the input bias currents. To determine the input bias current, you must first determine the input offset voltage of the device under test. And you can do that with the circuit by closing both switches S1 and S2 to get a circuit that looks like this. Closing these switches will bypass the two RS resistors and the output voltage will now be proportional to the input offset voltage of the device under test. And you can see my video on input offset voltage for more details on how the circuit works. Next, you can open up S2 and keep S1 closed. Now the input bias current will flow through this RS, which needs to be set to something much bigger than 100 ohms, like at least 100 kilo ohms or so. And that will create a voltage across RS and will introduce a DC error at the non-inverting terminal 
which can then be measured at the output. So that voltage measurement at the output will be the voltage from the input offset voltage that you've already measured, plus a voltage that is due to the bias current flowing through RS and into the non-inverting terminal. Then with some algebra, you can work out what the non-inverting terminal bias current is. Next, we can open S1 and close S2 so that the input bias current will flow through this RS into the inverting terminal and create a voltage at the inverting terminal, which will be measured at the output. This time, the output voltage will be the voltage from the input offset voltage minus a voltage due to the current that's flowing through RS here. And then again, with some algebra, you can figure out what the inverting terminal bias current is. So you've got the bias and current for the inverting terminal and for the non-inverting terminal, and we can use those two values to figure out the input bias current and the input offset current. Now, input bias current is something that we don't want. It adds a DC error to our system. But there is no general method for minimizing the effect of input bias current because there's no consistency in the nature of bias currents for different devices. They can vary in direction, cause, value, sensitivity to temperature. So for some devices, the two bias currents are closely matched, and for some, they're not. For some devices, the two currents are in the same direction, and for some, they're in opposite directions. For some devices, the current can flow in either direction. For some devices, the current is as low as 60 femtoamps. And for other devices, it can get up to tens of, mil tens of microamps. And for some devices, the current can vary significantly when the temperature changes, and for others, it doesn't. One method that op-amp designers do use to internally compensate for the input bias current is by adding current sources at the input bases that are inside the op-amp and provide biasing current for the input transistors Q1 and Q2. The current sources won't be the exact values required by the transistors, so there will still be some current that needs to come in through the inverting and non-inverting terminals, but it's going to be a lot smaller than if you didn't have those current sources. And since that current source might be a little less than needed or a little more than needed, the biasing current from outside the op amp might be positive, but it also might be negative. And if you see a plus minus on a data sheet for the input bias current, that's an indication that there's probably a bias current compensation circuit inside the op amp. You can also externally compensate for the input bias current if the biasing currents are well matched. So let's consider this inverting amplifier with the source grounded and consider that the I bias plus and the I bias minus here are pretty close to the same value. Well, we know that there's going to be a DC error introduced at V out due to the biasing current flowing through RF. So what if we put in another resistor at the non-inverting terminal to create an equivalent voltage drop that'll cancel out the voltage drop due to the current through this resistor? We'd get an inverting amplifier that looks like this one. Notice that I put the VIN voltage back in. As long as the two bias currents are approximately the same value, this will work fairly well. We just have to pick an appropriate value for RB. But what is that value? To figure that out, we want to figure out the equivalent resistance that's seen by this I bias as it flows into the op amp. So I'm going to use superposition principle and treat this I bias minus as a current source inside the op amp. And with the superposition principle, I need to short all of the other sources. So this V in source will be shorted to ground and this V out source will be shorted to ground. So I'm going to get a circuit that looks like this. So it looks like that I bias current flows through the parallel combination of RI and RF. So that means if I set RB to be a resistance that's equal to RI and parallel to RF, this should compensate for a large portion of the DC error contributed by this I bias current. And you can do a nearly identical analysis on a non-inverting amplifier to see a compensating value for RB would also be the parallel combination of those two resistors. So that should give you a good introductory understanding of the input bias current and what to do about it. Of course, there's a lot more to learn, and you can do that if you go to my website at www.electronics.ca, and you can find the link in the description. I also hope that this increasing complexity of op-amp circuits doesn't bias you away from trying to understand them. <sighs> I don't know which joke is worse, this one or the one from my input offset voltage video. Anyway... Thank you so much for watching and sticking it out to the end. I appreciate you. See you in the next one.